A Flight by Charles Dickens When Don Diego de, I forget his name, the inventor of the last new flying machines, priced so many francs for ladies, so many more for gentlemen, when Don Diego, by permission of Deputy Chaffwax and his noble band, shall have taken out a patent for the Queen's dominions, and shall have opened a commodious warehouse in an airy situation, and when all persons of any gentility will keep at least a pair of wings, and be seen skimming about in every direction, I shall take a flight to Paris, as I soar round the world, in a cheap and independent manner. At present, my reliance is on the Southeastern Railway Company, in whose express train here I sit, at eight of the clock on a very hot morning, under the very hot roof of the terminus at London Bridge, in danger of being forced like a cucumber or a melon, or a pineapple. And talking of pineapples, I suppose there never were so many pineapples in a train as there appear to be in this train. Phew! The hothouse air is faint with pineapples. Every French citizen or sightiseness is carrying pineapples home. The compact little enchantress in the corner of my carriage, French actress, to whom I yielded up my heart under the auspices of that brave child, Michel, at the St. James's Theatre the night before last, has a pineapple in her lap. Compact enchantress's friend, confidant, mother, mystery, heaven knows what, has two pineapples in her lap, and a bundle of them under the seat. Tobacco smoky Frenchman in Algerine wrapper, with Pete Hood behind, who might be ABDL, catered dyed rifle green, and who seems to be dressed entirely in dirt and braid, carries pineapples in a covered basket. Tall, grave, melancholy Frenchman, with black Van Dyke beard, and hair close cropped, with expansive chest to waistcoat, and compressive waist to coat, saturnine as to his pantaloons, calm as to his feminine boots, precious as to his jewelry, smooth and white as to his linen, dark-eyed, high-forehead, hawk-nosed, got up, one thinks, like Lucifer or Mephistopheles, or Zamiel, transformed into a highly genteel Parisian, has the green end of a pineapple sticking out of his neat valise. Phew! If I were to be kept here long, under this forcing frame, I wonder what would become of me, whether I should be forced into a giant, or should sprout or blow into some other phenomenon. Compact enchantress is not ruffled by the heat, she is always composed, always compact. Oh look at her little ribbons, frills, and edges, at her shawl, at her gloves, at her hair, at her bracelets, at her bonnet, at everything about her. How is it accomplished? What does she do to be so neat? How is it that every trifle she wears belongs to her, and cannot choose but be a part of her? And even mystery, look at her. A model. Mystery is not young, not pretty, though still of an average candlelight passability, but she does such miracles in her own behalf, that, one of these days, when she dies, they'll be amazed to find an old woman in her bed, distantly like her. She was an actress once, I shouldn't wonder, and had a mystery attendant on herself. Perhaps, Compact Enchantress will live to be a mystery, and to wait with a shawl at the side scenes, and to sit opposite to Mademoiselle in railway carriages, and smile and talk subserviently, as mystery does now. That's hard to believe. Two Englishmen, and now our carriage is full. First Englishman, in the moneyed interest, flushed, highly respectable, stock exchange, perhaps, city, certainly. Faculties of second Englishman entirely absorbed in hurry. Plunges into the carriage, blind. Calls out of window concerning his luggage, deaf. Suffocates himself under pillows of greatcoats, for no reason, and in a demented manner. Will receive no assurance from any porter whatsoever. Is stout and hot, and wipes his head, and makes himself hotter by breathing so hard is totally incredulous respecting assurance of collected guard, that, there's no hurry. No hurry. And a flight to Paris in eleven hours. It is all one to me in this drowsy corner, hurry or no hurry. Until Don Diego shall send home my wings, my flight is with the Southeastern Company. I can fly with the Southeastern, more lazily, at all events, than in the upper air. 
I have but to sit here thinking as idly as I please, and be whisked away. I am not accountable to anybody for the idleness of my thoughts in such an idle summer flight, my flight is provided for by the southeastern and is no business of mine. The bell. With all my heart. It does not require me to do so much as even to flap my wings. Something snorts for me, something shrieks for me, something proclaims to everything else that it had better keep out of my way, and away I go. Ah! The fresh air is pleasant after the forcing frame, though it does blow over these interminable streets, and scatter the smoke of this vast wilderness of chimneys. Here we are, no, I mean there we were, for it has darted far into the rear, in Bermondsey where the tanners live. Flash! The distant shipping in the Thames is gone. Were. The little streets of new brick and red tile, with here and there a flagstaff growing like a tall weed out of the scarlet beans, and, everywhere, plenty of open sewer and ditch for the promotion of the public health, have been fired off in a volley. Whiz. Dust heaps, market gardens, and waste grounds. Rattle. New cross station. Shock. There we were at Croydon. Burr. The tunnel. I wonder why it is that when I shut my eyes in a tunnel I begin to feel as if I were going at an express pace the other way. I am clearly going back to London now. Compact Enchantress must have forgotten something, and reversed the engine. No. After long darkness, pale fitful streaks of light appear. I am still flying on for Folkestone. The streaks grow stronger, become continuous, become the ghost of day, become the living day, became I mean, the tunnel is miles and miles away, and here I fly through sunlight, all among the harvest and the Kentish hops. There is a dreamy pleasure in this flying. I wonder where it was, and when it was, that we exploded, blew into space somehow, a parliamentary train, with a crowd of heads and faces looking at us out of cages, and some hats waving. Moneyed interest says it was at Reigate Station. Expounds to mystery how Reigate Station is so many miles from London, which mystery again develops to compact enchantress. There might be neither a Reigate nor a London for me, as I fly away among the Kentish hops and harvest. What do I care? Bang! We have let another station off, and fly away regardless. Everything is flying. The hop gardens turn gracefully towards me, presenting regular avenues of hops in rapid flight, then whirl away. So do the pools and rushes, haystacks, sheep, clover in full bloom delicious to the sight and smell, corn sheaves, cherry orchards, apple orchards, reapers, gleaners, hedges, gates, fields that taper off into little angular corners, cottages, gardens, now and then a church. Bang, bang! A double-barreled station. Now a wood, now a bridge, now a landscape, now a cutting, now a bang. A single-barreled station, there was a cricket match somewhere with two white tents, and then four flying cows, then turnips, now the wires of the electric telegraph are all alive, and spin, and blur their edges, and go up and down, and make the intervals between each other most irregular, contracting and expanding in the strangest manner. Now we slacken. With a screwing, and a grinding, and a smell of water thrown on ashes, now we stop. Demented traveler, who has been for two or three minutes watchful, clutches his great coats, plunges at the door, rattles it, cries, hi, eager to embark on board of impossible packets, far inland. Collected guard appears. Are you for Tunbridge, sir? Tunbridge? No. Paris. Plenty of time, sir. No hurry. Five minutes here, sir, for refreshment. I am so blessed, anticipating Zamiel, by half a second, as to procure a glass of water for compact enchantress. Who would suppose we had been flying at such a rate, and shall take wing again directly? Refreshment room full, platform full, Porter with watering pot deliberately cooling a hot wheel, another porter with equal deliberation helping the rest of the wheels bountifully to ice cream. Moneyed interest and I re-entering the carriage first, 
and being there alone, he intimates to me that the French are no go as a nation. I ask why. He says, that reign of terror of theirs was quite enough. I ventured to inquire whether he remembers anything that preceded said reign of terror. He says, not particularly. Because, I remark, the harvest that is reaped, has sometimes been sown. Moneyed interest repeats, as quite enough for him, that the French are revolutionary, and always at it. Bell. Compact enchantress, helped in by Zamiel, whom the stars confound, gives us her charming little side-box look, and smites me to the core. Mystery eating sponge cake. Pineapple atmosphere faintly tinged with suspicions of sherry. Demented traveler flits past the carriage, looking for it. Is blind with agitation, and can't see it. Seems singled out by destiny to be the only unhappy creature in the flight, who has any cause to hurry himself. Is nearly left behind is seized by collected guard after the train is in motion, and bundled in. Still, has lingering suspicions that there must be a boat in the neighborhood, and will look wildly out of window for it. Flight resumed. Corn sheaves, hop gardens, reapers, gleaners, apple orchards, cherry orchards, stations single and double-barreled, Ashford. Compact enchantress, constantly talking to mystery, in an exquisite manner, gives a little scream, a sound that seems to come from high up in her precious little head, from behind her bright little eyebrows. Great heaven, my pineapple. My angel. It is lost. Mystery is desolated. A search made. It is not lost. Zamiel finds it. I curse him, flying, in the Persian manner. May his face be turned upside down, and jackasses sit upon his uncle's grave. Now fresher air, now glimpses of unenclosed downland with flapping crows flying over it whom we soon outfly, now the sea, now Folkestone at a quarter after ten. Tickets ready, gentlemen. Demented dashes at the door. For Paris, sir. No hurry. Not the least. We are dropped slowly down to the port, and sidle to and fro, the whole train, before the insensible Royal George Hotel, for some ten minutes. The Royal George takes no more heed of us than its namesake underwater at Spithead, or under earth at Windsor, does. The Royal George's dog lies winking and blinking at us, without taking the trouble to sit up, and the Royal George's wedding party at the open window, who seem, I must say, rather tired of bliss, don't bestow a solitary glance upon us, flying thus to Paris in eleven hours. The first gentleman in Folkestone is evidently used up on this subject. Meanwhile, demented chafes. Conceives that every man's hand is against him, and exerting itself to prevent his getting to Paris. Refuses consolation. Rattles door. Sees smoke on the horizon, and knows it's the boat gone without him. Moneyed interest resentfully explains that he is going to Paris too. Demented signifies that if moneyed interest chooses to be left behind, he don't. Refreshments in the waiting room, ladies and gentlemen. No hurry, ladies and gentlemen, for Paris. No hurry whatever. Twenty minutes pause, by Folkestone clock, for looking at Enchantress while she eats a sandwich, and at Mystery while she eats of everything there that is eatable, from pork pie, sausage, jam, and gooseberries, to lumps of sugar. All this time, there is a very waterfall of luggage, with a spray of dust, tumbling slantwise from the pier into the steamboat. All this time, Demented, who has no business with it, watches it with starting eyes, fiercely requiring to be shown his luggage. When it at last concludes the cataract, he rushes hotly to refresh, is shouted after, pursued, jostled, brought back, pitched into the departing steamer upside down, and caught by mariners disgracefully. A lovely harvest day, a cloudless sky, a tranquil sea. The piston rods of the engine so regularly coming up from below, to look, as well they may, at the bright weather, and so regularly almost knocking their iron heads against the cross beam of the skylight, and never doing it. Another Parisian actress is on board, attended by another mystery. 
Compact Enchantress greets her sister artist, oh, the compact one's pretty teeth. And Mystery greets Mystery. My mystery soon ceases to be conversational, is taken poorly, in a word, having lunched too miscellaneously, and goes below. The remaining mystery then smiles upon the sister artists, who, I am afraid, wouldn't greatly mind stabbing each other, and is upon the whole ravished. And now I find that all the French people on board begin to grow, and all the English people to shrink. The French are nearing home, and shaking off a disadvantage, whereas we are shaking it on. Zamiel is the same man, and ABDL Cater is the same man, but each seems to come into possession of an indescribable confidence that departs from us, from moneyed interest, for instance, and from me. Just what they gain, we lose. Certain British gents about the steersman, intellectually nurtured at home on parody of everything and truth of nothing, become subdued, and in a manner forlorn, and when the steersman tells them, not exultingly, how he has been upon this station now eight year, and never see the old town of Bulham yet, one of them, with an imbecile reliance on a reed, asks him what he considers to be the best hotel in Paris. Now, I tread upon French ground, and am greeted by the three charming words, liberty, equality, fraternity, painted up, in letters a little too thin for their height, on the custom house wall, also by the sight of large cocked hats, without which demonstrative headgear nothing of a public nature can be done upon this soil. All the rabid hotel population of Boulogne howl and shriek outside a distant barrier, frantic to get at us. Demented, by some unlucky means peculiar to himself, is delivered over to their fury, and is presently seen struggling in a whirlpool of touters, is somehow understood to be going to Paris, is, with infinite noise, rescued by two cocked hats, and brought into custom house bondage with the rest of us. Here, I resign the active duties of life to an eager being, of preternatural sharpness, with a shelving forehead and a shabby snuff-colored coat, who, from the wharf, brought me down with his eye before the boat came into port. He darts upon my luggage, on the floor where all the luggage is strewn like a wreck at the bottom of the great deep, gets it proclaimed and weighed as the property of Monsieur a traveler unknown, pays certain francs for it, to a certain functionary behind a pigeon hole, like a pay box at a theater, the arrangements in general are on a wholesale scale, half military and half theatrical, and I suppose I shall find it when I come to Paris. He says I shall. I know nothing about it, except that I pay him his small fee, and pocket the ticket he gives me, and sit upon a counter, involved in the general distraction. Railway Station Lunch or dinner, ladies and gentlemen. Plenty of time for Paris. Plenty of time. Large hall, long counter, long strips of dining table, bottles of wine, plates of meat, roast chickens, little loaves of bread, basins of soup, little carafes of brandy, cakes, and fruit. Comfortably restored from these resources, I begin to fly again. I saw Zamiel, before I took wing, presented to compact enchantress and sister artist, by an officer in uniform, with a waist like a wasp's, and pantaloons like two balloons. They all got into the next carriage together, accompanied by the two mysteries. They laughed. I am alone in the carriage, for I don't consider demented anybody, and alone in the world. Fields, windmills, low grounds, pollard trees, windmills, fields, fortifications, Abbeville, soldiering and drumming. I wonder where England is, and when I was there last, about two years ago, I should say. Flying in and out among these trenches and batteries, skimming the clattering drawbridges, looking down into the stagnant ditches, I become a prisoner of state, escaping. I am confined with a comrade in a fortress. Our room is in an upper story. We have tried to get up the chimney, but there's an iron grating across it, embedded in the masonry. After months of labor, we have worked the grating loose with the poker, and can lift it up. We have also made a hook, and twisted our rugs and blankets into ropes. Our plan is, to go up the chimney, hook our ropes to the top, descend hand over hand upon the roof of the guardhouse far below, shake the hook loose, watch the opportunity of the sentinels pacing away, hook again, 
drop into the ditch, swim across it, creep into the shelter of the wood. The time is come, a wild and stormy night. We are up the chimney, we are on the guardhouse roof, we are swimming in the murky ditch, when lo! Kavila, a bugle, the alarm, a crash. What is it? Death? No, a mien. More fortifications, more soldiering and drumming, more basins of soup, more little loaves of bread, more bottles of wine, more carafes of brandy, more time for refreshment. Everything good, and everything ready. Bright, unsubstantial looking, scenic sort of station. People waiting. Houses, uniforms, beards, mustaches, some sabots, plenty of neat women, and a few old visaged children. Unless it be a delusion born of my giddy flight, the grown-up people and the children seem to change places in France. In general, the boys and girls are little old men and women, and the men and women lively boys and girls. Bugle, shriek, flight resumed. Moneyed interest has come into my carriage. Says the manner of refreshing is not bad, but considers it French. Admits great dexterity and politeness in the attendance. Thinks a decimal currency may have something to do with their dispatch in settling accounts, and don't know but what it's sensible and convenient. Adds, however, as a general protest, that they're a revolutionary people, and always at it. Ramparts, canals, cathedral, river, soldiering and drumming, open country, river, earthenware manufactures, cryo. Again ten minutes. Not even demented in a hurry. Station, a drawing room with a veranda, like a planter's house. Moneyed interest considers it a bandbox, and not made to last. Little round tables in it, at one of which the sister artists and attendant mysteries are established with Wasp and Zamiel, as if they were going to stay a week. Anon, with no more trouble than before, I am flying again, and lazily wondering as I fly. The tumble-down old buildings plastered with many colored bills that nobody read? Where are the two and twenty weary hours of long, long day and night journey, sure to be either insupportably hot or insupportably cold? Where are the pains in my bones, where are the fidgets in my legs, where is the Frenchman with the nightcap who never would have the little coop window down, and who always fell upon me when he went to sleep, and always slept all night snoring onions? The tumble-down old buildings plastered with many colored bills that nobody read? Where are the two and twenty weary hours of long, long day and night journey, sure to be either insupportably hot or insupportably cold? Where are the pains in my bones, where are the fidgets in my legs, where is the Frenchman with the nightcap who never would have the little coop window down, and who always fell upon me when he went to sleep, and always slept all night snoring onions? A voice breaks in with, Paris. Here we are. I have overflown myself, perhaps, but I can't believe it. I feel as if I were enchanted or bewitched. It is barely eight o'clock yet, it is nothing like half-past when I have had my luggage examined at that briskest of custom houses attached to the station, and am rattling over the pavement in a hackney cabriolet. Surely, not the pavement of Paris. Yes, I think it is, too. I don't know any other place where there are all these high houses, all these haggard-looking wine shops, all these billiard tables, all these stocking makers with flat red or yellow legs of wood for signboard, all these fuel shops with stacks of billets painted outside, and real billets sawing in the gutter, all these dirty corners of streets, all these cabinet pictures over dark doorways representing discreet matrons nursing babies. And yet this morning, I'll think of it in a warm bath. Very like a small room that I remember in the Chinese baths upon the boulevard, certainly, and, though I see it through the steam, I think that I might swear to that peculiar hot linen basket, like a large wicker hourglass. When can it have been that I left home? When was it that I paid through to Paris at London Bridge, and discharged myself of all responsibility, except the preservation of a voucher ruled into three divisions, of which the first was snipped off at Folkestone, the second aboard the boat, and the third taken at my journey's end? It seems to have been ages ago. Calculation is useless. I will go out for a walk.
The crowds in the streets, the lights in the shops and balconies, the elegance, variety, and beauty of their decorations, the number of the theaters, the brilliant cafes with their windows thrown up high and their vivacious groups at little tables on the pavement, the light and glitter of the houses turned as it were inside out, soon convince me that it is no dream, that I am in Paris, howsoever I got there. I stroll down to the sparkling Polaire Royal, up the Rue de Rivoli, to the place Vendôme. As I glance into a print shop window, moneyed interest, my late traveling companion, comes upon me, laughing with the highest relish of disdain. Here's a people, he says, pointing to Napoleon in the window and Napoleon on the column. Only one idea all over Paris. A monomania. Humph. I think I have seen Napoleon's match. There was a statue, when I came away, at Hyde Park Corner, and another in the city, and a print or two in the shops. I walk up to the Barrier de la Toile, sufficiently dazed by my flight to have a pleasant doubt of the reality of everything about me, of the lively crowd, the overhanging trees, the performing dogs, the hobby horses, the beautiful perspectives of shining lamps, the hundred and one enclosures, where the singing is, in gleaming orchestras of azure and gold, and where a star-eyed hurry comes round with a box for voluntary offerings. So, I pass to my hotel, enchanted, sup, enchanted, go to bed, enchanted, pushing back this morning, if it really were this morning, into the remoteness of time, blessing the southeastern company for realizing the Arabian nights in these prose days, murmuring, as I wing my idle flight into the land of dreams, no hurry, ladies and gentlemen, going to Paris in eleven hours. It is so well done, that there really is no hurry.